And he actually had to remind his congregation that he's not saying life is a game. Obviously, life is not a game, right? But life is a lot like a game. That's the truth. Life is like a game in that there's clear winners and losers. There's prizes and trophies. There's victory and defeat. There's coaches and mentors. There's testings and trainings. You can say that life is a lot like a game. Amen. And I believe that God wanted you to hear this word, church, that life is like a game and God wants you to win. Amen. Amen. In every single area of your life, whether it's your finances, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your parenting, God wants you to win. And if God didn't want you to win, church, then why would he say things like you're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus? If God didn't want you to win, church, then why would he say things like greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world? If God didn't want you to win, then why would he say things like if you follow me, I'm going to make sure that you're blessed and not cursed, that you're healed and not sick, that you're always on top and never at the bottom. If God didn't want you to win, church, then why would he say things like if you obey my voice, I'll make sure that your barns are filled with plenty and that your vats overflow with new wine. Amen. If God didn't want you to win, church, then why would he tell you in Proverbs, hey, keep my commands, listen to my instruction, because if you do it, I'll make sure that you have long life, peace, and prosperity. The three things that everybody in life is chasing after, health, wealth, and peace of mind, God promises that you don't have to chase it, all you have to do is chase him, amen? Amen. And he said that if you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things would be added unto you, amen? So yeah, life is like a game, Proverbs, or sorry, Romans 5.17 says it like this, and I'll read the second half where it says, How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Right there, y'all, the Bible says that the will of God is for you to reign in life. Notice how it says reign, right? R-E-I-G-N. That's a, a royalty word. has to do with royalty. God looks at you and he sees you as royalty. God sees you as a king, a queen. God sees you as a a kingdom citizen. Amen. And the Bible says that God wants you to reign in life. Can you just let that sit in your soul, church? That truth that God wants you to reign in life through Jesus Christ. And think about it like this, church. If God's will is that you reign in life, then the opposite would also have to be true, that the devil's will is that life reign over you. And at that point, you got to make the decision, amen, which one's it going to be? Are you going to reign in life or is life going to reign over you? That means nothing is supposed to be reigning over you. No wonder God said, I want you to be the head and not the tail. What's the difference between the head and the tail? Well, the tail goes wherever the head tells it to go, amen, and the head gets to go wherever it wants to go and the tail just has to follow. So if there's areas in your life where you feel like, man, I'm the one doing all the following. I'm the one that this addiction tells me what to do. This addiction tells me go here, go there. This addiction says go left, I go left. If it says go right, I go right. I don't want to live like that anymore. Amen. Then you can say, no, no, no. God wants me to be the head and not the tail. So how do I get to a place in my life where I'm doing that? Amen. Where I'm reigning in life. So, yeah, church, life is a lot like a game. And you need to settle it in your heart that God wants you to win. Amen. And I want to remind you, church, that the whole game was started by God himself. If you look in Genesis chapter 3, 14, the whole thing was started by God himself in the Garden of Eden when he declared war over the serpent. It says in Genesis 3, 14, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, that word, somebody say enmity. That, somebody say enmity. enmity. That word enmity means open hostility. Unending beef, basically, we got beef. <laughs> Unending beef, just hostility. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. According to God, y'all, the game started right there. And as you can see, there would be a clear winner and a clear loser. He told the serpent, you're going to be at war with the seed of the woman. Only problem with that is that women don't have seed. Only men have seed. So we know that God was mysteriously declaring right there from the beginning that the seed of the woman, right? We now know that the woman there is the Virgin Mary and the seed of the woman is the divine seed, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Jesus is that divine seed. And then remember what he said. He said, look how he says it. He says, you're going to strike his heel. He's talking to the seed of the serpent. He says, you're going to strike his heel. Y'all, y'all know what that is, right? When he strikes his heel, he's saying, look, he's telling the serpent, you're going to look like you won an initial victory over the seed of the woman. You're going to strike his heel. You are clearly going to be able to strike his heel. Well, you know what that is? That's the cross. When Jesus Christ was being crucified on the cross, it looked to the devil. It looked to the serpent like, hey, we won. <laughs> he saw Jesus on the cross and man, we won. We got we did it. And he's high fiving all the demons like we, we got him. They assumed that they won. <laughs> the devil looked at his demons and they assumed that they won. And you know what happens when you assume? <laughs> you can laugh. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. So. The Bible says that. Think about it. He says, I'm gonna, you're going to strike his heel. That's the cross. But he said that same heel was going to crush your head. So on the cross, it's the same place where it looked like the devil won a victory. That's the same place where actually he got his head crushed. That's why we look to the cross to this day, church, because it's the same place where all our victory comes from. I look to the cross because I know that's where I won the victory. I look to the cross because I know that's where all my sins were forgiven. I don't even have to question it. I know that my sins were forgiven 2,000 years ago when Jesus paid the price on the cross on Calvary. Amen. That's why it says in Colossians 2.14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. What that means, y'all, is that when it comes to our sins... They were literally against us, like we were in a heavenly court of law, and the devil knew that we had sin. How many of y'all know you have, does anybody in here ever sin? Uh, well, the devil knows that you sin, and so he knows that God is holy, and he knows that God is just, and he knows that God doesn't just look at sin and go, ah, it's all right. No, the devil knows, no, God doesn't let sin slide. So what he, what, what the way he looks at it is, hey, I've got them. You know, they're guilty in a heavenly court of law. And so since God has to punish sin, just like he's going to punish me is what he's thinking. He said, he, he, I, I got to get these guys to sin and then God will get them. What he did not know was that 2,000 years ago, God had a plan that he would unfold that said, yes, I'm going to punish sin, all sin. See, you got to settle it in your heart, church. God hates sin. Can y'all say that with me? God hates sin. See, I got no problem knowing God hates sin. Because I know what he did with it. I got no problem knowing that God hates sin because I know what he did with it. 2,000 years ago, God said, I'm going to take all sin, past, present, future, all of it, and I'm going to punish it once and for all. And he punished it on the body of his own son, Jesus Christ. He literally took all the anger, all the wrath that he had, and let Jesus take on all the sins of the world poured it on him so that all the wrath of God could be poured out on Jesus Christ right there on the cross. And when he did that, Jesus said, it is finished. Once Jesus took all the wrath of God, he said, it is finished. God emptied the wrath right there on the cross so that he literally has no more wrath left in him. Amen. It was all, that's why you can, as a Christian, you can walk around with confidence knowing all my sins, all the anger that God has against my sin, he already poured it out on his son Jesus. So there's none left for me, because if there was some left for me, then that means what Jesus Christ did is not enough. And I know that it was more than enough. Amen? All my, all my sins have been paid for. So look what it says. Let's keep reading it. It says, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, having disarmed the powers. and the Do y'all see that, church? Disarmed the powers and authorities. Church, if he disarmed the powers... The way that they were armed before was they had your sin against you. The devil could bring up your sin and there was nothing you could do about it. He could make you feel bad and condemn you because, you know, you're a horrible person. He's just hold that against you. But when they disarm the powers, that means that he's got nothing against you. And when the devil reminds you of, of, of your sin, all you got to do is remind him of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because that's how it was forgiven. So he says he disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross, triumphing over them by the cross. On the cross, y'all, Jesus won. And because he wins, we win. Because he wins, we win. This is like all bases are loaded, two outs, bottom of the ninth, all two very whoever it is, goes up to bat, hits that home run. It doesn't matter if you're on one of the bases or you're in the dugout. You could be on the injured list, homesick, and you still win. <laughs> If you're on the team, you win. Amen. You still get a ring like everybody else. When Jesus Christ won on the cross, we won the victory with him because we're in him. Amen. 
all those who are in Jesus, the victory that he has, we have it. Amen. So I'll say it again. Life is not a game, but life is a lot like a game. And in many ways, Jesus changes the game. That's the whole point we're trying to make here, church. Life is like a game. It is. And God wants you to win. And remember, Jesus changed the game. In many ways, he changed the pathways to victory, right? The, the world has its own pathways to victory. And Jesus changed those, right? So he changed the old ways of getting the victory, the old ways like competing or comparing. Jesus, the old way is you compare yourself. You say, oh, I'm a good person because you look at some horrible person. You say, oh, at least I'm not like them. At least I'm not like my sister, you know. Not, not me, I'm talking about y'all sister. <laughs> at least I'm not like my brother. You know, we, 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 we got these people we compare ourselves to. But no, Jesus changed the pathway to victory. Now I don't have to look down on an, another person to feel good about myself because now I can say, no, we're all sinners in need of a savior. He changed the pathway to victory. I don't have to look down on you to feel good about myself because Jesus made it to where we're all sinners in need of a Savior. So that I could look at you and go, yeah, you might be a horrible person, but me too. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. And so I looked at Jesus and go, it's, all, it's cool, I'm just like you. Jesus is the one that we all need. Hey, you need some, so do I. I need Jesus. Amen? And now we don't have to compare ourselves. Jesus changed the game. And now we don't have to compete. I don't have to sin in order to win. See, the old ways of, of, of getting back at people, I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to sin through, through climbing. See, the old way of climbing was the old way that you won, the old way to pass to victory was, was you had to climb the ladder of success. You had to climb up higher and you had to climb up faster. And, and, and whoever you had to, 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 to kick on the way up there, kick them down, that was just collateral damage. That's the old pathway to victory because Jesus changed the game. Now it's not about who can climb up the fastest. Now it's about who can climb down the fastest. And he said, the greatest among you will be the servant among you. Whoever wants to be the most, all they got to do is be the least. Amen? He changed the game. Now it's about who can serve the most. Praise God. When he washed the feet of the disciples, he said, go and do likewise. Amen? Amen. The old way of winning, we don't have to do that anymore. You remember when Peter was in trouble, when he was getting arrested, and the Bible says that he pulls out a what? He pulls out a sword. That's the old pathway to victory. The way that you get out of a situation, you pull out a sword. And Jesus told him, man, put it away. I'm changing the game. We don't have to do that anymore to win. Later, when Peter would actually get arrested, the Bible says that all the, the church got together and they all prayed. And an angel came and God broke him out of prison. <laughs> The old pathway was the sword, but now Peter, no, man, the new pathways are, are prayer. Things like surrender, because Jesus changed the game. Amen. Jesus changed the game. Now it's, now it's giving in order to get. Now it's forgiving in order to heal. Now it's surrendering in order to win the victory. Now it's picking up a weapon of praise to defeat the enemy. Nobody had ever heard of pathways to victory like this. We all had, we all as Christians, we have to come and unlearn the old ways that we've been, that we've taught ourselves to win the victory. You've got to unlearn all that. In the kingdom, there's new ways to victory. Amen. The old ways that you used to use to get the victory was, I'm talking about something as simple as somebody at work gave you a hard time and now you feel bad about yourself and now you need a triple chocolate cake to feel better. Okay, that's an old way of the, of, of the pathway to victory. And listen, church, maybe sometimes, I'm telling you as your pastor, I love you. Maybe sometimes God will say, daughter, here's some cake. Praise God. But other times he's saying, daughter, you haven't prayed today at all. Hello. The old pathways to victory, we've got to un unlearn those. The old pathways of, man, I get revenge. I run to this drink. I run to this drug. I run to this person who says all the stuff I want to hear. Those are old pathways to victory. Now you got to run to God in prayer. Amen. Those are the new pathways to victory. Praise God. Amen. The old pathways is I got to ignore my family for the next three years because I got to work overtime. And so uh, I, sorry, I can't be there for the birthdays, the anniversary, nothing, because it's the old pathways to victory. If I don't get it, nobody's going to get it for me. And forgetting that you have a shepherd who loves you. Amen. And that he'll take care of you. And then if you just trust him and do things his way, he knows exactly what you need and he'll take care of you better than you can take care of yourself. Amen. Amen. 
Jesus not only changed the pathways to victory, but I believe Jesus changed even the prize of victory. I'll close by saying that Jesus even changed the prize of victory. You know, the old things that people wanted, maybe they still want them, obviously, fame, power, glory, Jesus changed that. He says, now the great, the great ultimate prize is me. Jesus made himself the ultimate prize. Amen? Think about anybody in the Bible, Abraham and Sarah. They said, oh, if we could just have a son. Now we know Jesus is the divine son that we all want. Amen? Just like Abraham and Sarah. The Israelites, they were in the wilderness and they said, oh, if we could just get into the promised land. And now we are like the Israelites in that we live in this world, which is kind of like a wilderness. And we're looking forward not to the promised land, but to Jesus Christ himself. Amen. And like the Israelites got through the wilderness by trusting God, we're going to get through this wilderness by trusting God and looking forward to the day where we meet Jesus face to face. Amen. Because he is our ultimate prize. And just like King David said, oh, if I could just have a temple Man, if we could have a temple that houses the presence of God. Well, now we know Jesus is the temple. Amen. He is the one that is our Emmanuel, God with us. When we have him, we have God. We have God. King David was looking for a temple so he could be in the presence of God. We have Emmanuel, God with us. We, because we have Jesus with us, we've got God. We don't need to necessarily build a temple. Every time we, we, we call out the name of Jesus, God is with us. He said, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. Amen? Amen? Adam and Eve, after they got exiled from the Garden of Eden, they said, oh, if we could just get back in the garden. And what did Jesus say? It is finished. And then the Bible says the veil in the temple that separated man from God was torn in two from top to bottom. And so Jesus is our way back into the garden. Everything that people long for, God said the answer is Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes. You're thinking, oh, if I could just get that raise. But God says, you just need my son, Jesus. Oh, if I could just get that promotion, all you need is my son, Jesus. God, if you could just save my marriage, then everything, you just need Jesus. God, if you could just bring my kid back, no, no, you just need Jesus. God, if you could just help me beat this problem I have, you just need Jesus. Yep. Jesus made it all about him. He is our ultimate prize. Yep. Amen? Amen? The Israelites, when they were exiled from their homeland, literally exiles. They were saying, oh, if we could just get back home, if God would just say, okay, enough, your punishment's over, you can come back home. Jesus is the end of our exile. He ended all of our exile, amen, and said, all the punishment for your sin, I'll take it on myself. And now he is our way back home, and he welcomes us with open arms, amen. Jesus is the only thing that we need. Esther, Queen Esther, she said, oh, if I could just have favor with the king. How many of y'all know, church, Jesus is our favor with the king? Because we have him, we have favor with God. Ruth, Ruth said, oh, if I could just have a redeemer, Jesus Christ is our redeemer. Amen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, oh, man, if we could just be saved from the fire, Jesus is with us in the fire. Amen. He saves us from it all. I'm telling you, Jesus changed the game because he is our ultimate prize. He is the one thing that we all need. He's the one thing we should all be striving for. He's the one thing that we should all have our eyes focused on. Amen? And whatever else you need, God will take care of it in time. As long as you keep your eyes on the most important thing that matters, which is Jesus Christ. And church, listen, if you don't get it now, you'll get it later. So the best thing is that you get it now. Because one day we're all going to see that anything that we were doing in life, all that really mattered was Jesus Christ, His will being done. That's the only thing that truly mattered. All the stuff that we try to hide behind, all the accomplishments we try to hide behind, all the achievements we try to hide behind, all the stuff that we want to accumulate that we try to hide behind, none of that stuff will ultimately matter unless it was done by the will of God, unless it was done according to making Jesus more famous, unless it was done to make more people hear about his son. That's the only thing that matters. You know why I want to be a good husband? Because I want to represent Jesus. You know why I want to be a good parent? Because I want to represent Jesus. I want my kids to see Jesus in me. You know why I want to be a good pastor? Because I'm hoping I can lead people to Jesus. Amen. You got to make it all about Jesus. You know why I want to make more money? So I can give more to the kingdom. That's what you got to make it all about. It's all about Jesus.